it's 1979. I get an assignment from Newsweek magazine to photograph this author. He doesn't like to be photographed, but we do know he picks up his mail in Windsor, Vermont. This Jeep pulls up, and he gets out, and he goes into the post office really quickly. And then as it came back out, I got it. I got Salinger. Hi, welcome to What the Flick. We're feeling very reclusive and mysterious today to talk about Salinger. We too are nine years in the making, like this documentary. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Christy, this is Ben, this is Alonzo, this is Gray. Um, a lot of hype and a lot of expectation about Salinger. Yeah, I'll describe Salinger. Uh, Salinger is a uh, documentary about J.D. Salinger. <laughs> the publication of Catcher in the Rye in 1951 was a revolution. There had not been a voice like that. When you're a kid and you read Catcher in the Rye, you're just like, oh my God, somebody gets it. I remember that being the first book you take with you. It is a phenomenon. How many millions and millions came to that book? At the height of that success, he disappears. He became the Howard Hughes of his day. If one person used something I had written as their justification for killing somebody, I'd say, God, people are crazy. But if three people use something I had written as justification. When I read the reviews of the people who didn't like this, and I haven't read you, but I know what you're going to say. You do? I do. I know some of it. Because you're that good? Because you know what I'm going to say? Right through you. <laughs> because these people are right. Like the, the, the documentary gimmicks that are used in the recreations, they're terrible. The I don't usually are, mind those. The reenactments. No, but they're bad here. I know you, I'm saying, but I think they're bad here. Ah. The reenactments are lousy. The yeah. music is uh, lousy. And I think there's a lot of manipulation to the music. That said, didn't really care about those things. I learned. 278% more than I knew about J.D. Salinger before. Therefore, I liked it. It's uh, just, yeah. go ahead. No, 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 you. Okay, it's so crammed. And it's got so many people who may or may not have anything actually insightful to say. There's a lot of Martin Sheen. Yeah. The but he's the best one of all of them. He's very good, but you you don't, you're never told other than he's a guy who must have liked Catcher in the Rye. There is no connection between these really famous people who get very high billing wherever you see references to the film. Like, Danny DeVito was interviewed at some point and did not make the final cut here. Right. This is how jammed this film is. Edward Norton says like one thing. Yeah. John Cusack says like one thing. And I feel like it's so jammed and so meandering and it's so overlong. And it's all build up to this revelation at the end about further Salinger works, what the hell is he doing all that time in the, in the woods in his cabin. And that's already out. Like, that information is already out there. I, I, I and it's all though. the I mean, build-up to like, da-da-da, there are more books coming. I mean, yeah, it's, it's long, but I don't feel like the movie is just building up towards that moment. That moment is a nice little cherry on top. But obviously, I think this is one of those things where it, it depends on how interested you are going in. I went through that Salinger period in, like, ninth grade where I read all, you know, the, the, the not-that-much published material, but whatever there was. Um, you know, and so I was very excited, and I learned a ton, like Ben did. Um, and I I, I, I agree with you about the interviewees. They could have totally lived with that. I think the actors in this don't really add yeah. anything. Yeah. They should they should have talked to Wes Anderson mm -hmm. because if you've seen the Royal Tenenbaums, like here's a guy who's read him some Salinger, yeah. you know. Um, and they 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 do. There's some odd choices like. There's a section where they talk about how Hinckley and Chapman and the guy who shot Rebecca Schaefer were all inspired by Catcher in the Rye, which is interesting, and that's, that's, a, that's a point to explore. But then the movie doesn't build on that at all. It doesn't give you, it doesn't connect it back to Salinger. What did he think about it? Well, did he respond? And, but then, the, sorry, then the, they also quote John Guare in that section without mentioning the fact that John Guare in Six Degrees of Separation has that whole speech where the care the black character talks about why assassins love Catcher in the Rye. I mean, it just, and I kind of thought, well, let's, can we make that? No? Okay, I fine. I agree with you and disagree with you because the, one of the, you know, in one of the taglines for the movie is, is that you know is that you. I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't remember it. But you, that you that you sort of reveal stuff about the man without sort of it, while maintaining some of the mystery, and that's part of the issue is that we don't know, we don't have any clue how Salinger reacted to having three people killed while they held three while they held his book. Um, and you, you can only imagine that for a guy who wanted privacy, that that must have been terribly and a guy who was struggling with dealing with people with some people 
uh, must have been incredibly difficult. So I thought they could have done more with that, but I forgive them not getting how Salinger reacted to it because yeah. how the hell would they know? Uh, uh, somebody, they would find somebody who knew. They, they, I mean, they were. I, well, I would say if they found somebody who knew, they would have put him in. I, they, right. I mean, the only person who really they knows. Found everybody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like they don't really talk to anyone from that point on in his life who knew him. You know, so I thought that was interesting. I wanted more with that. I'm forgiving that they couldn't get more. I thought the Joyce Maynard parts were very interesting uh, that came about toward the end of the movie. Um, I, I didn't know much. I thought that when I saw a picture, I thought, that's cool. Look at that. It's J.D. Salinger. <laughs> but they, then they had the same picture over and over again. There's like two photos of J.D. Salinger, both of which he's holding a cigarette and like they go back to that over and over again. So while this film is over two hours long, it's also really repetitive. So, and that's why they, uh, that's why clearly there were some of those recreations in there. Cause right. they, okay. and I There's thought, a ton of footage and I just thought, they, <laughs> hey look, they found a guy who looks like a young Josh Brolin, right, you know? <laughs> but he didn't, so, but he, because he didn't look like Salinger, I would have made a real effort to shoot him from behind and over the shoulder or something. But when we got the face shots of him, it just felt, distracting and I didn't even get that it was supposed to be like Salinger in a theater looking uh, at his own, I, like it just, yeah, that, that, uh, that, I, it was that, bad. That's, that's, that totally, that, yeah, I, yeah. I am not down for that, but I, I have to say. children on the floor looking at him as he writes yeah, them. Yeah, it's yeah, very, yeah. very pretentious. But quite, like, uh, here's the thing, I, 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 I did not know about the first wife in Germany. I did okay. not know about him dating Una O'Neill before she that. married no. Charles Chaplin. I, and I kind of went in with a couple of things thinking, all right, I wonder if they're gonna mention, like are they gonna mention My Foolish Heart? And they did, mm -hmm. uh, although it's actually a better movie than people give it credit for, even though Salinger hated it. Um, you know, they, they were, I, I thought it really kind of covered things well. I could have done with a little less of the Bigfoot sighting stuff. Like, yes, we get it. He hid away and it was yes, hard to get pictures. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. they, they were friends. Spoiler. Um, no, but like, you know, there's like all the photographers who would camp out at the post office to get the photo and da da da. It's like one of those would have been fine. There's, there's a little much of the stalker fan I stuff. I really think it, it was over two hours and based on the, like, and because it was a little repetitive, that we could have, that there's probably 96 minutes in there that would have, that you could have avoided the recreations and still revealed much of the information. It was still worth it to me, definitely, and I think Salinger fans, and there's still great mystery left because you don't, you really don't know why or what was going on. This is a guy who couldn't relate what was interesting is that he clearly couldn't relate to a lot of people, and he's got some serious psychological. I didn't know about the World War II stuff. I didn't know how profound or how much action he yeah, saw. I didn't know that he'd liberated Dachau. You know, two hundred, <laughs> two hundred, not single-handedly, but <laughs> two hundred <laughs> days of fairly relentless combat post D-Day. Um, so this is a guy who had major issues in in relating to women and people and people who liked him. But that said, then there are all these other stories about in that town in New Hampshire, no, goes to dinner, goes to the fair, people see him, he's like, hey, how's it going? Hey, Jerry. Uh, right, uh, and I didn't get that he had an obsession with teenagers. Okay. But, but, one, that, but yeah. one that he, <laughs> but, but that said, he mitigated a little bit. I mean, the fact that he like waited for, he met this one girl at 14, fell in love with her, but didn't touch her until she was 18, and yeah. only then when she mauled him. Yeah, but then yeah. then he like he deflowers her and almost immediately dumps her and then dumps Aww. her. Right, it's totally. Like, yeah. Yeah. He, he's a mess. Imagine that she but, had a first row seat to learning about life from J.D. Salinger, not a book, like literally from right, him. Yeah, and right. she apparently and she was the inspiration insight. for Esme. Uh, no, she, she has insight. No, but there's this weird kind of like predatory serial thing he has with these girls. Like yeah. he, he gets older and Young they stay the and same. Yeah, you know? like, like Wooderson. And the same kind of letters to them over and over again. And, and the, the one thing that creeped me out was that with two different younger women, does he make them sit around the cabin in New Hampshire and dance with him to Lawrence Welk? Yeah. That was totally creepy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, creepy. Well, it's but, a pattern. But interesting. And there have been so many puff piece movies of late about you know big subjects that I was glad at least that this movie was able to acknowledge, yes, Great writer, also kind of a shit and not good uh -huh. to women. You know, or it his wasn't. Own family. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't just this sort of like, oh, he was so great. Or you some know. friends too. I mean, he like he, you know, yeah, he cut off a hotshot for changing a, a title for nothing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So yeah, so Shane Salerno initially wanted to make this a feature, and wanted uh, to have Daniel Day Lewis 
play Salinger. Oh, a narrative feature. Wow. Yes. Oh. Um, um, Hillel Itali, my, my former AP colleague, was obsessed with Salinger too and did a whole piece on Shane Salerno's obsession. And he wanted to make a film with Daniel Day-Lewis, with, with him in mind. And the more research he got into, the more he realized, I've got to make a documentary about this because there's just too much out there that has not been told before. And so. he has co-written a biography that came out this week yes. in conjunction with I, the film. I, would, I, I think that there, it would be interesting to see uh, a, a narrative feature because we'd fill in we'd fill in those blanks. Granted, we'd be making it up, mm -hmm. but we'd be educated guessing about what went on from the time he threw Joyce Maynard out until 2010. You know what would be awesome is if J.D. Salinger is played by Daniel Day-Lewis, put an ax in Brendan Gleeson at some point. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, so. um, uh, anyway, I, I liked it. It was, uh, I, I was totally interested in it. I, I gave it a seven. There's some obvious weaknesses, but I liked it. Five. I guess, what did I guess, seven, seven two. Seven, 7.2, yeah, the, the, the recreations are terrible, but not so terrible that they didn't, that they got right. in the way of all the amazing things I learned. So if you're a Salinger fan, absolutely you should see this movie. If you were less interested, maybe not. Well, and you guys are being more generous than uh, all of the critics, because it's hovering around 31% rotten on the tomato meter. Yeah, that's right. I, I think it's definitely worth seeing.